Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm Josh, and today I am about to wade into one of the most contentious conversations you can ever have amongst the car folk, and that is environmental impact. And I already know that this video is going to piss off people in every corner of the room, and that's okay. You all can come at me in the comments all you want, but I don't think that we can fully discuss Toyota and their new products the way that we do on this channel without also addressing the environmental impact that they are making. And it's a video that I've wanted to do for quite a while because because you guys know I love my V6s and my V8s and I've, I've complained a lot about their new turbo engines but ultimately there's a lot more to that discussion that I've been wanting to talk about for some time on this channel and today we are going to get around to doing it. So what I'm going to do is break this video down into two sections. First, I want to go over some numbers that no one ever looks at and those are the emissions per miles numbers and what it means for your environmental impact with the car that you buy or that you are driving. And then in the second half, I want to talk about my personal philosophy as it relates to wanting to do right by the environment while still owning and loving my big earth-burning V8 truck. So let's go ahead and dive in. Now, before we get into this, I want to give a very clear disclaimer that all the numbers that you're going to see in this video are sourced from the United States Department of Energy, and both the numbers and their calculation methodology are published publicly on fueleconomy.gov. So if you feel the need to fact check or dispute anything that you see here in this video, feel free to head on over to fueleconomy.gov and actually Actually, I think everyone should head on over there after they're done with this video to check out all the data that they have to offer and as well look at the environmental impact of your vehicle or any of the cars that you are looking at out there on the market today. Okay, so with that, let's get into emissions. Now, when most people are going out there and shopping for and researching a new car, the only numbers that they're really looking at are the numbers that are going to have a direct impact on their bottom line. So things like MSRP, projected reliability scores, projected depreciation, fuel economy ratings, warranty term, cost, and coverage, etc. Again, all the things that you will, in theory, have to shell out money for over your ownership term of that car. However, there are two other numbers that I think everyone should care about, even if they have no direct impact on your bottom line, and those are the smog score and emissions per mile of a vehicle. So let's go ahead and hop over to fueleconomy.gov and we'll find out exactly how to look up those numbers on any car you are interested in. And not only can you look up any car in here, but you can also get really detailed tailpipe CO2 and upstream greenhouse gas emissions numbers for any car out there. And there is a wealth of additional data on top of that. You can even compare multiple cars side by side to see them one next to another. And this is tremendously interesting data that I think everyone out there should really look at from time to time to figure out where their car or any car they're interested in stacks up against the broader auto market in terms of its environmental impact. And before sitting down to do this video, I actually did exactly that with some of the cars that we have owned in recent years and talked about here on this channel. And we're going to start with the most egregious of offenders, which is, of course, my GX460. So according to the Department of Energy data, the GX460 produces 542 grams of CO2 per mile in tailpipe emissions, in addition to another 124 grams of upstream greenhouse gas pollution for a total of 666 grams of pollution per mile. Now, let's look at the Camry V6. It produces a total of 410 grams of pollution per mile. So, considerably less, but that makes sense because the 2GR FKS V6 is a smaller engine, and it also has technologies that make it a more efficient engine than the 1UR FEV8 in the GX. Now, let's add in the NX350H, and obviously because it's a hybrid with a four-cylinder engine, we have a much lower 273 grams per mile, and we see the same trend when we add in the Prius, which has an even smaller engine and is an even lighter and more efficient car at a total of 187 grams of pollution per mile. And finally, we're going to add in the RAV4 Prime, but keep in mind, like I've said before, averaging the RAV4 Prime down to one single number in terms of fuel economy or environmental impact is almost impossible because it can vary so much based on how you drive your RAV4 Prime and how much of your time is spent in EV mode versus gas hybrid mode. 
Now, what you'll notice here is different with the RAV Prime versus all the non-plug-in cars on this table is that the tailpipe emissions on the RAV are actually lower than the upstream greenhouse gas numbers. And that's because in the RAV4 Prime, the bulk of most people's carbon footprint is actually coming from the electricity that you're using to charge the battery in the car. And this number will change as well based on your local energy mix or any renewable energies that you may have available to you. However, here in my home zip code, our city still largely relies on coal-fired power plants. And so the electricity that we use to charge the RAV4 Prime is still generated by coal. And so that's how we get this upstream greenhouse gas number. And what's really interesting about this is although some BEV owners out there may like to think that their car has zero impact on the environment, according to the Department of Energy's calculations, we see the same thing with BEVs. Although there are zero tailpipe emissions, there is still a carbon footprint being incurred by the energy that it's taking to charge the EV's battery. And of course, a larger EV like the F-150 Lightning will consume significantly more energy to fill up its larger battery than a much smaller Model Y, which has a much smaller battery. However, it is absolutely worth noting that overall, that impact and that footprint is much lower and much smaller than that of a comparable non-EV in the same vehicle class. And on that note, let's take a look at another full-size truck, the Toyota Tundra. And specifically, we're gonna do a side-by-side -side comparison from before and after the shift from naturally aspirated V8 to turbo V6 because Toyota has claimed that emissions are the primary reason for their wholesale move from bigger naturally aspirated engines to smaller turbo and turbo hybrid engines. And when we look at the DOE's numbers, we can see that by downsizing the engine from the last gen to current gen Tundra, Toyota did in fact cut 200 grams per mile of total emissions with the iForce Turbo V6 while also significantly increasing its performance. And with the iForce Max Turbo Hybrid V6, which is optional in the Tundra, we get even more power with even fewer emissions. And that's really quite something. And we see the same thing comparing the old V8 LX570 at 771 grams per mile to the new Turbo V6 LX600 at the same 561 grams per mile as the Tundra, which makes sense because it's the same engine. That also means that a full-size Tundra or LX is better on the environment than my mid-size GX460. And that, of course, means the new GX should also be able to cut its emissions by about 25% when the 2024 comes out. And it would be a pretty safe bet that the new Land Cruiser and 4Runner with their turbo hybrid four cylinders will do even better to cut emissions versus what they are today. And so here's the thing. Objectively, the driving experience of these new turbos and turbo hybrids has gotten worse, and long-term reliability on these engines is still TBD. But you can't argue that the trucks have gotten significantly better in the process for the environment. And this is where Toyota actually takes a rather unique approach in terms of reducing its emissions than some other automakers out there. Because Toyota believes that the best way to achieve carbon neutrality and reduce emissions of its overall fleet is to have everyone play a part in that, not just hybrid owners and BEV owners and plug-in hybrid owners. So Toyota thinks anyone who chooses to buy a new Toyota vehicle is also choosing to help reduce emissions of overall vehicles on the road and as such make the planet a better place for all of us. And I think that's the right approach because as we know, EV sales have stagnated. And so we have to make huge strides with all the other vehicles on the road that people do want to buy today, like full-size trucks, like big SUVs, in order to reduce our overall vehicular carbon footprint in our society. And so that's why I've said many times that, you know, as sad as I am to see things like the 2GR V6 and the 1UR V8 go away, Ultimately, I completely understand why they're going away, and I think it is the right choice for Toyota to get rid of those engines. And I fully understand, by the way, not wanting to buy some half-baked turbo-hybrid four-cylinder engine, especially in a big SUV or truck like a 4Runner or a Land Cruiser, but Toyota claims that since 2010, they've reduced the emissions from their overall fleet as a whole by 41%. And that's pretty impressive considering that the bulk of Toyota's sales are still ICE vehicles 
and hybrid vehicles because plug-in hybrids are still pretty niche and they had one BEV that pretty much flopped. So the long-term environmental impact is there. It is making a difference. It is happening. And I actually do think that that's worth sacrificing some of the smooth and refined driving behavior of the old, big, naturally aspirated engines for that long-term, much brighter future of Toyota's smaller engines. Now, with all that said, let's move on to the second half of this video, which is my view on petrol heads and environmentalism. And keep in mind that these are simply my opinions here on my channel. In the words of Ina Garten, This is what I do. You can do whatever the f you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just having fun here. Yeah. Okay, so if you're a regular viewer of mine, you'll know that my pride and joy is a Lexus GX460 with the absolutely incredible 4.6 liter 1UR FE V8 under the hood. And despite that, in the same breath, I'm going to tell you that protecting the environment and reducing my carbon footprint is very important to me. Now, I am no eco-warrior, but I think I'm at least a little more conscious about my environmental impact than the average person out there. And I do think that us petrol heads, us car people can be environmentalists while still loving and owning a big barn burning V8. Like ever since we were able to afford to have three cars, we have always tried to keep a super efficient daily driver in the garage for doing most of our driving in. And so we had a Camry hybrid, we had the NX hybrid, we had the Prius, and of course we have my RAV4 Prime as well. And so neither my 4Runner that came before the GX nor the GX itself has ever been daily driven, in part because I don't want to drive a big gas guzzling truck around on the daily. And most days I just drive the RAV4 Prime to keep the majority of my driving done on either EV or hybrid range. And you might not think that choosing to drive the Prime over the GX would make a big difference, but let's actually look at the numbers. So here are the per mile figures on the RAV4 Prime and the GX that we saw earlier. The Prime essentially reduces my overall emissions output by about 76% relative to the GX. On my average commute to the office, which is about 40 miles round trip, in a GX, that would be 58 pounds of CO2 I'm putting out in the atmosphere, versus the Prime, which would only put out about 16 pounds of CO2 on that same drive. And if I were to drive about 10,000 miles a year in both cars in the GX, I would emit 7.34 tons of CO2 versus the Prime, where I would only put out about 2.16 tons. So hypothetically, with that 76% reduction in emissions from the GX to the RAV4 Prime, it would take me about four years to have the same impact on the environment in the Prime that I would have in just one year with the GX. So here's the thing about being a petrol head today. The golden age of cars with amazing engines and big displacement engines that are incredible to drive is coming to an end. V8s are almost extinct and V6s aren't far behind. And I really do, at the end of the day, think that that's best for the greater good. That said, this is why I've been so vocal, by the way, about this being the time to get that last great V6 or V8 car, because there are still a few great ones that are around that you can buy brand new today. And especially if you buy a really reliable one, like a Toyota or a Lexus, you can hold on to that. And 50 years from now, we can both be driving our antiquated V6 and V8 cars in the slow lane while all the electric cars go flying by. So anyway, that is my TED Talk for today. Thank you for listening. If any anyone is still listening out there. Um, I really appreciate all of you so, so much. I've gotten so many questions about this that, again, I just felt like I had to come on and put my stake in the ground somewhere. This is where I'm choosing to plan it for the moment. And again, thank you guys so, so much for watching and for listening. Um, questions and comments, you can always leave them downstairs or write me here at the email that you see on screen. I hope you guys have a great one. I will talk to you soon in the next one and take care.